गुड आफ्टरनून एवरी वन थैंक यू फॉर बींग हेयर अर्ली फ्रॉम लंच एंड माई नेम इज अपराजिता अग्रवाल आई एम होपिंग द रूम विद फिल अप एंड पीपल आई वी वुड हैव टू डू अनदर राउंड ऑफ इंट्रोडक्शन मिड वे थ्रू दिस पैनल सो माई नेम इज अपराजिता आई लिव इन मुंबई इन इंडिया एंड आई वर्क विद इन टेलीकैप एंड रन फोरम कॉल संकल्प फोरम विच इज लाइक सो कैप वर्क इन इंडिया East Africa and Southeast Asia um and our primary job is to help build social entrepreneurial ecosystems uh so we work with uh with a few hundred social enterprises over the years over the last 12 years we've worked with them in various capacities supported them through um through hand holding capacity building helping them become more investable and showcasing them uh to investors um I have three of our social enterprises here people who we've had the fortune to work with uh quite closely um so i'll i'll go with a quick round of intro introductions and then ask them to talk about about their companies so i'll go with the uh, rustam first who's on um on the leftmost side um rustam is uh the founder and ceo of boond uh boond is a company that is into distributing uh solar products and they create rural entrepreneurs and work in a few difficult geographies in within india um His company has impacted over five fifty thousand lives in India, and it's about a little over two years old. Um, then, you, then we have Manik. Manik Mehta. He is okay. The names uh, here might not necessarily all correspond to who we have on stage, but Manik um, is the is the co-founder of a company called Leaf Innovations or Leaf Variables, and he uh, his company works on producing. women safety and family safety sort of devices that can be uh, that can be worn as jewelry uh he's just out of out of his graduate school um two two months ago <laughs> yeah approximately <laughs> and uh and he also works in india uh but his product sort of uh, is is slated to go go global uh then we have lohan and i'm no, did, did i get that right yeah yeah, yeah okay yeah. <laughs> um and he works in rwanda uh he runs kigali farms he's the founder and ceo of kigali farms uh which uh, produces mushrooms um so i'm going to leave it at that and and then ask them to talk a little bit more about the business so rustam shall we start with you and if you can talk about your business thanks i was just waiting for the next fast food uh, you know english so that we so thanks a lot for coming uh, the mic is not working yeah is my mic on i don't think i hope so. so yeah i don't yeah now it's better so um like i said it's hard competing with you know the fly by going by so uh, thanks for coming and um, thanks to prajita for the invitation so this is actually a good picture where we are uh, we do solar energy access in indian villages uh which basically means we set up solar power plants which drive microgrids and give electricity to people who live in the off grid areas uh these people are typically like you see in the picture right now are uh, people living mostly below 2 dollars a day and they have no electricity so they have a lot of problems in their productivity uh so we've been doing this for 4 years now and uh we it's nice to be in san francisco uh and we are trying to raise around another round of funds soon uh, so our website is boon.net if anybody is more interested so find it thanks manik what's the big idea that you're working on so at leaf innovation we thought you know we believe that everyone deserves to be safer that's why we made the product safer so right now imagine a girl walking down the street and she feels danger what she does she just takes out the jewelry and double taps it and it sends an alert to our server from there we forward to your friends family police who can then live track you via the mobile application so we are working on a women safety solution as of right now we want to move towards kids safety and the family safety in its overall entirety and specifically in the developing in the developed worlds too because it's a it's a case where everything is on the global scale we have 6 billion people and we need at least protection for all of them what's happening in syria or turkey everyone needs protection and everyone's need safety our thought process is if we can enable communication if everyone knows there's something wrong that problem is going to be solved if no one knows there's there's no chance of that problem being solved so what we are doing is enabling communication so that the safety and the security increases currently we are in a fundraising round we are looking to raise somewhere around 500000 so mm -hmm. no why mushrooms 
Well, mushrooms are, uh, are both uh, something very new and innovative, uh, believe it or not, in, in, in Africa, but they're, they're also something very old. Mushrooms have been uh, cultivated in Asia for you know, over a thousand years. In, in Europe and the US, it's a much uh, younger uh, crop. Uh, only about 150 years ago uh, did they start working on mushrooms in Europe, about 100 years in the US. And in Africa, it's, it's sort of brand new. It's just a, a cottage industry right now. Um, to the point that uh, Africa, all of Africa, the, with the one billion people in there, produce less mushrooms, in fact, three times less mushrooms than all of Australia. And that strikes me as <laughs> not right. Um, they eat mushrooms. Mushrooms are eaten in, uh, in the countryside. Uh, mushrooms are imported in cans from China, oftentimes, uh, in the cities. And so there's, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's something to be done there. You might. Maybe should I say why mushrooms? Yeah, why mushrooms? <laughs> you might say, well, fine, they don't do mushrooms. What's the big deal? They just don't need to do mushrooms. Uh, but in fact, um, because you probably think mushrooms is that little white thing I find in my salad sometimes that's not really interesting. And you couldn't be more wrong because uh, mushrooms are actually extremely, extremely nutritious. I'm not talking for all mushrooms necessarily, but oyster mushrooms, which we're working with now, and button mushrooms. Uh, they're really rich in protein, all the essential amino acids, uh, zinc, iron. And they're, so from a nutrition point of view, which is what drove me to do this in Rwanda, they're, they're, they're a true powerhouse. Uh, but then there's a really good business fit, in fact, with uh, the region. Uh, and when you think about Rwanda in particular, as you know, it's a small country, uh, very densely populated, which really means that people have very little land to work with. Um, most farmers uh, are stuck needing to make a, a living. They're farmers because nobody will give them a job, so then you have to make your own food, and that makes you a farmer all of a sudden. But you're really stuck having to make a living for your whole life from very little land, which on top of that over there happens to be uh, pretty poor soil. And mushrooms, you know, sort of solve for that because one of their key characteristics is very, very high yields. For on a, on a stage like this, on a stage like this, a little less than a stage like this, a farmer could make um, a dollar a dollar a day. So a stage like this is about one percent of the land holding of a one, the famous one-acre farmer, right? So one percent of their land could be a mini cash crop. So that was a big idea for me. Um, they don't need good soil. You can grow mushrooms right, you know, in this room. In fact, well, it'd be a very nice room for growing a lot of mushrooms. Um, <laughs> they don't need good soil, and the reason is that, in fact, you feed mushrooms. Mushrooms, um, they're not plants. That's the big thing, the one-on-one thing to remember. Mushrooms, they're not plants, so they don't photosynthesize. They do not get their energy from the sun. In fact, like like you just an hour ago, and all of us, uh, they get their energy from digesting organic matter. So when you're farming mushrooms, what you're doing, you're basically making their food, uh, and their food happens to be organic waste. And even in, in poor countries, there is a lot of waste to go around. And uh, if you look at the wheat field, half the biomass of the wheat field is a straw. We turn that straw into a nutritious food. And another really interesting factor is that it turns out uh, mushroom growing is really well suited uh, for women. Uh, because mushrooms need, and it's not a heavily physically demanding job, but they need the attention to detail and, uh, and tender loving care, I like to call it. Women tend to be better at that than, uh, than us men, mm -hmm. um, which is an, not a really interesting dimension. So, Laura, you were running a successful microbrewery before this, mm -hmm. and you've had a fairly successful career behind you, and you had a choice to, um, to literally pick, you know, put a pin on any place in the globe and, yeah. and do your next big thing. Yeah. Why Kigali in Rwanda, and you know what took you there, and you know what are you trying to achieve in terms of you know your your yep. vision there? Yeah, you're right. I was in the in the beer business before, which uh, I can tell you, if you want to make friends, it's a great industry to go <laughs> to go into. I never had as many friends. It was it was a lot of fun, but at some point I figured um, uh, the world probably has enough beer. Uh, would there be something more more useful to do? And it was a long thought process, but I read that book by Jacqueline Novogratz, and some of you maybe read The Blue Sweater, and it was a big eye-opener for me, because um, I, I, you know, if you read the book, it's her, when she got her big moment, her aha moment was, you know, in, in, in Rwanda. Um, and I, have, I had, as a young man, gone through the region, uh, uh, maybe, you know, 10, 20 years before that, and, and I saw the same poverty she did, but it did nothing for me. At the time, I don't think I had a lot of empathy. I'm like, okay, well, they're poor. That's just the way it is. And, and reading the book, it just was an eye-opener for me. I'm like, oh, there's, there's something wrong. And now I'm, I've become a, a good businessman, and maybe I can put these business skills to good use. And I, I was eager to do more business, but have it have a positive impact. And that's why I became Rwanda. And, and I'm glad you brought the beer, because very briefly, um, 
here's one mushroom, here's one fungus that's, that's widely successful around the world. It's uh, yeast. Yeast that's used to make beer is actually a fungus. I don't know if you knew that, but it's important. So I went from liquid fermentation to solid fermentation. It was not that much of a life change, yeah. really. So. Great. Manik, your company is yet to go to, you're really yet to go to market, right? Yeah. Um, and, and you have a few other co-founders who work with you. Um, what's the big idea you're trying to drive? And, and you know, as you try to sort of take it to market, where are some of the challenges um, that, you're, that you're sort of seeing right now? I mean, obviously they may change when we meet next year at SoCap, but yeah. right now? So there are quite a few things, you know. I'm like five co-founders, we started together. So we were reading this book, by Ab it's called Abundance by Peter H. Demandis. A lot of you guys might have heard about it and read about it. And it said, if you have to take a society from tier zero to tier one, what all things you have to do? And I was reading it back in India and I was realizing this fact, me and my co-founders, that safety is such a big fact and without safety or freedom of speech and movement, nothing else can change. And we were all from engineering graduates, you know, we are, I'm from Delhi College of Engineering, my co-founders from IIT Delhi, like we're the topmost college from India. And we thought if we guys can't solve this problem, no one else across the globe can. So we thought of working towards it. That's how it formed a year back. And then within six months, now we are all grad engineering graduates. That's the best thing. So we had everything done in-house, hardware done in-house, software done in-house. Everything can be managed by us and the quality can be controlled by us. Mm -hmm. So the quality control is what we are actually good at. You know, being back in India and everyone thinking that hardware is only made in US out or in European nations. But being able to control what we are working on and how we are working is the major thing. And coming to your second question, that's about going towards market. So we realize this fact that this is a, not a really Indian issue. So we have a lot of pre-orders coming in from Europe itself. And there's this whole need in Africa, Southeast Asia, and in SOCAP, I realize in the US, you know, all the campuses and everywhere. This is, it, it is a big need. So how do we cater to it? And that's the reason why I'm raising funds, so that I can build the infrastructure around it, mm -hmm. so that when I am ready, I can start a huge launch, so that I can cover global base at one point of time. So you have travel from US to India or US to South Africa, you don't have to keep on changing your cell phone or keep on changing your things. It's the same hardware working everywhere. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, but it's a difficult market to start up. Uh, and you know, India is not really highest in terms of doing business. Um, I'd love to know, you know what, what were the real challenges in sort of setting up, setting up a company, starting to get it off ground? Were there any specific unique challenges that you saw? Uh, Say, One of the challenges which I personally faced was the fact that to getting things done in India is still a m huge problem. Mm -hmm. The bureaucracy is still very slow. It takes time to get things done. And also the funding part, you know. I, when I came towards Silicon Valley and I visited all the campuses and everyone who's d working out here, it's easier to get the money inflow to work on things which you want to. Mm -hmm. Back at home, it's still a problem. You might have a brilliant idea. So what we did was we became innovative. We started going towards all business plan competitions around. We won 10 or 12 of them across the globe. And that's how we started out. Because we didn't have money to do things. Mm -hmm. And even right now, you know, money is a huge problem. Great. Rustam, would you want to talk a bit about the, the big idea that you're driving and the kind of impact you hope to drive with it? Sure. So, um, so we, we, we are sitting in a room with like probably 16 lights staring at us. And we are barely 50 people, yeah. right? So uh, that's, that's really funny and ironic because about a week ago, I was in a village which has about uh, 16,000 people, about 800 households, and they probably use less lights than we have today. <laughs> so that's, that's the irony that we, you know, which is kind of uh, strange and which is kind of hits us on the face. And once you've you know, seen the dark side, it's, it's fairly easy to comprehend the problem. Uh, I'm a graduate of the University of California in Irvine, which is in Orange County, so it's down south. And um, after working in Deloitte for a fair bit of time, and I lived up in, you know, on Clay and Franklin, just 10 blocks down the street, uh, you know, you kind of desensitize yourself to actually global problems. So like uh, Laurent or, um, you know, Manik here, I went back to India, which is my home country, uh, spent some time in the village, and I was appalled. I mean, you. You know, in the morning you wake up, you have sanitation issues. You don't know where to go or to do what. In the afternoon, you, have, you need water, and there's somebody who'll have to go all across to collect water to get it for you. In the evening, 
by five, you basically wind up whatever you're doing because you're in the dark. And this is, uh, you know, the big, big problem is it's not a few handful of people. Uh, it's about 200 million people in India alone. Uh, maybe, f you know, about 350 in South Asia. So that's, that's incredible, huge. Uh, but what's more interesting is it's not just a problem, it's an opportunity. Because, you know, energy is the foundation for any kind of economic growth. It's, it's the platform. So I look at it as opportunity. I look at it as the fact that, you know, we have s some skills that we can push there. And it's a market waiting to open up. It's a market which is, uh, you know, easier to capture the value in. Uh, so that's, that, that was the logic behind starting. Uh, we spend a lot of time, you know, fighting the government. Now we actually joined the government and work together with them. Yeah. Uh, we, we had a lot of time, um, we spent a lot of time trying to raise funds. We, we raised around. Um, and a fair bit of time actually understanding the need. You know, we just spent our life there because that's, I think, the biggest challenge that most, most entrepreneurs, especially the ones you know, frequenting SOCAP, uh, need to understand is this is all great, but, you know, you have to spend a substantial amount of time with the people down there to understand what they want. Um, so, and that's, that was the biggest, uh, you know, mm -hmm. aha moment for us is, you know, the whole demand process driving the design and then the demand process also structuring the business model around what we do. Um, so I guess that yeah. would be no, my that's... answer. And what kind of capital are you looking to, to raise? I mean, what, what sort of money do um, you need to make it all come together? What kind of capital? Like one which is green in color? No, but, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, we, we, we are trying to raise up. So this would be sort of our Series A, which is we raised a seed and a little bigger, about half a million dollars last year. But we are trying to raise about three to four million dollars, mm -hmm. which sets us, you know, which gives us the power to set up microgrids in at least 350 villages across a okay. uh, couple of states. It also lets us, uh, you know, enter into uh, newer territories and build on the technical expertise. Because the other big problem with energy access for people who know energy access is there's not a substantial amount of technical competence on the ground to actually deliver these solutions. Mm -hmm. So while you know you might make uh, like a weird shaped light sitting in a lab over here. Uh, it's hard when it breaks down to get it fixed. And that inherently kills the value of the whole product. Right. So a lot of money will actually go into creating that ecosystem because our approach is basically to build the whole ecosystem around mm -hmm. servicing, around affordability, uh, around even getting design feedback. So that's what we'll do. Right. Manik, for you, um, what kind of capital? You talked about it briefly, but since you're yet to go to market, um, and I think one specific part that I wanted to understand from you, when, when you look at startups and startups like yours, you know, what are the, the pitfalls that, that entrepreneurs should be aware of when they are starting to raise capital? So there are two kind of things, you know. You can raise too early, you can raise too late. So that's what happened. Before we even actually formed the company, we raised around. It was a competition, but we raised around. So that was a little too early for us in our stage. And right now, when we are looking to raise, we are looking in the middle of a, like what he said, right? A middle of a series A and a seed mm -hmm. because we have pre-orders to cater to and we have a global market and a global distributor is coming towards us. Mm -hmm. So how do we cater to that? So it has to be a middle of things and if it's not done right, then you face problems like what I'm doing right now. Right. <laughs> right. Running around here and there. <laughs> now, for you, um, you're in the middle of a capital raise yourself. Right. Where do you see the challenges? Um, how difficult or easy has it been? Uh, it's been difficult. I have to say it's been a, a very difficult process. Um, that's cost me about 15 months right now. And I was probably naive in the process at the mm -hmm. beginning. I used to be an investment banker way, way back when at the beginning of my career. And so you know, I'm good at making forecasts and stuff. And it, it looked plain vanilla. Uh, what we're, just, uh, just a little word though before I explain. What, what I talked about earlier was uh, oyster mushrooms. And oyster mushrooms are really amazing, they're, they're great social vehicle again because growers can grow them on very little space and so on. Uh, the market for it is not ginormous, so we, we need to give ourselves a little bit of time and we're, uh, we're racking our brain and finding solutions for that. We need some time for that. On the other hand, we, we noticed that the, what the customers, what a lot of uh, the more uh, upper end customers wanted was the butt mushroom, you know, the, the, the traditional white mushroom that, that we're, we've all been eating. Now, um, and that one, there's, there's demand for, and you know, that's what we would substitute for imports and so on. Uh, but that one requires a little bit more capital. So once we decided to go into button mushrooms, so I, I'm seeing oyster mushrooms and button mushrooms as the two wheels of a bicycle right now. We've got the oyster mushrooms, which are incredibly social, and that's really the mission of the company. I, 
I didn't leave my life and the, the nice job I had before to become a button mushroom, just a button mushroom farmer in Africa. That, that would defeat the purpose a little bit. Yeah. But the oyster mushrooms are there because, you know, that's, that's the lifeblood of the company. That's what I really want to be doing. At the same time, you have to recognize you need cash flow. And there's demand for button mushrooms. And the two mushrooms do share things. You know, they're, they're not the same things. They're, they're like, I don't know, wheat and maize. You know, they have a lot in common, but they're different. So, but for the, the button mushroom, however, we do need capital. And, and that... I thought was going to be really easy because you can show very nice, very nice cash flow, very easy to reimburse the loan. So I just went to commercial banks. I, I, I don't know if it was a mistake or what, but it's been a year and a half. And, and you know, I told you at the very beginning that what we're doing is both very old but very new. And I'm telling you, to commercial bankers sitting in Africa is very new. It's, it's much too new. And innovation is nice until you're asking someone to fund it because then it becomes all of a sudden not nice at all. And it's understandable. They don't have a precedent and so on. So maybe I, I became too engrossed in my idea, believing mm -hmm. in it, and I couldn't quite convince the bankers. It didn't help that a lot of those, you know, the credit analysts in the, inside somewhere in the bank building had probably never eaten a button mushroom in their life. But for them, they were asking to analyze the most exotic product they'd ever seen. So it took a long time. Um, then I went to talk to some social, social investors and they're funny because they have tunnel vision. They, well, they all have different agendas, and you don't always know what it is. And it's not like their website is going to explain it honestly. Um, but they, they're looking at, at, at my bicycle thing. And some, some people focused on the oysters and said, that, that's really beautifully social, but you're never going to make money with that. And, and then other guys look at, at, the, at the butt mushroom. They say, that's really great business, but that's not so social. <laughs> and then they're not really putting two and two together the way, the way I'd like to do. So it's, it's been a hard mm -hmm. process. Right now, we, 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 we found someone who actually gets it. Right. I think the expression is grox it. Mm -hmm. It really, really gets what we're doing. So I, I think we're at the end of the, the tunnel. Mm -hmm. uh, though I've said that before, mm -hmm. and the tunnel was still there. Um, so I think, it, I think it's all coming together. But I had to then understand you know, the, the needs of the people across the table from me. I realized that you know, we're looking for about $600,000. But given that I realized it was going to be impossible in the channels I was looking for, I re-looked at the business plan. I'm like, okay, well, how can I reduce the ask so that at least we can get going, produce those button mushrooms, show the banker what it is, how it works, that it sells, and so on, and then go look for the, the second phase. So we cut the investment in two phases, mm -hmm. and now we're only looking for about three hundred thousand okay. dollars, and some of it we're likely to get as a grant from someone, and the, and the rest then we can finally get as a loan. Right. So I'm going to come to another critical issue, and because we're all working in developing markets and emerging economies. You know, how do you balance building a successful business, a successful profitable business, and impact? Because most of the time, you guys are raising money from social investors, impact investors. Everybody has their, their eye on the impact that you create, the jobs that you create. The, um, how do you, maybe, Rustam, if we can start with you, and you can tell about how do you, how do you balance that bit? You're always starting with me with the hard question, right? <laughs> <laughs> but um, so I mean, we, we have we have a turnover of around, about a little more than a million dollars right now, hmm. and we do make profits. Uh, and I think that that's very important. Hmm. I think if you call yourself a business, you have to generate revenue because you've got to pay salaries, you've got to grow, and you've got to do all that. Uh, so I think that's primary, especially in the area of energy access where we work in, that we need to make money. Uh, but we, we make impact, and we've clearly defined it in three ways, and that's uh, defined through our team and also to the investors. Number one is the communities we work with, and that's very important. I could be selling solar in San Francisco and making a lot more money, but I choose to sell it in off-grid areas in India, which makes me social and not a commercial. Mm -hmm. Number two, the kind of products we sell in. I could sell cigarettes in the village and make a ton of money, believe me, or maybe beer, you know, and <laughs> get it from my friend here. And, but I don't choose to do that. I choose mm -hmm. to actually sell solar power plants. So that makes us uh, you know, pretty much uh, social. And the third is uh, the vision of the core team is aligned because most of, so I was also an investment banker. It seems like the worst job to do before you start a company. <laughs> but um, so I was working out of Singapore mm -hmm. and you know, selling fixed income bonds. But th the fact is the core team's complete vision and the inclination and the opportunity cost that they left behind to do this is the third factor which makes us social. And I think We've encapsulated the definition in mm -hmm. all in just these three primary terms. Who do you sell to? What do you sell? And what's the intention of the core team? What's the sacrifice they're making? And that makes it very simple for us. We don't go around saying that we're going to cross subsidize or we're going to you know somehow starve or you know sell my firstborn child or whatever. 
but we make it very clear that uh, you know these are the metrics, and if investors like these metrics, great. If they don't like it, then you don't like it. I mean, right. it's not right. everything to be like that. Right? And how, how crucial is creating impact for women? I mean, is, is, is there a specific focus around that in your business, given there, that you there work is, in villages? There is. I mean, it's like Laurent mm -hmm. mentioned, like mm -hmm. women, uh, women run enterprises or women led managed enterprises are more sustainable, and especially in developing countries, because women tend to be more loyal to what they are doing, they tend to actually do it much better. So we, we, we do have a fair number of women, and we uh, regularly have trainings for setting up women entrepreneurs, because what we found is, if the entrepreneur is a woman, uh, she tends to be more on the educational front. So she'll educate the person about solar energy, about the need for clean energy, about the need for access, and be a little you know, softer in the commercial front, which mm -hmm. is actually great for you know, the penetration that we do. And, um, and of course, I mean, it's also, you know, uh, it also gives us the softer edge because it's a very commercial market. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think it's fairly important for us. Yeah. Manik, I know women's safety is built into your business itself, but uh, you're also looking at the family safety market and you know, how, do you, how do you look at creating impact? What are, you know, what are the specific metrics if you're if you guys are already thinking through those in terms of women impact and the kind of impact that you hope to generate so as he said you know women impact so i'm just taking a line from Rustam, you know <laughs> women impact is very much important and how you do that because women is the one who's running the family out there mm. so that's the reason why we went for women safety first and rather than kids or an elder safety yeah. those products are already selling out there and they're good so why women safety if you can secure the f core of the family that's how you move forward mm. You get those few things secure, and then you start moving forward. Because it's more about giving freedom and empowering them so that they can travel at night, they can travel when they want to. And we feel safe, you know. Feel that, feel that people will know if there is a problem out mm -hmm. there. Feel that there is a way out to go at night and, you know, just be there. Work at a night time in a BPO or do anything of that sort. So that's what we realize at that point of time. And moving towards the family safety, you know. It's just not... So you start with women, and then there's a the kid safety that comes in. And the safety angle overall in the developing nations, even the developed nations, you know, people, uh, kids get kidnapped every eight minutes. That's a United Nations statistics across the globe. A woman is high as 12.5 seconds. So that's huge. We have to sort those issues out before we even think of moving towards solar cities. They are brilliant. The <laughs> idea is nice. Everything's amazing. But, but the basic question is if we can't provide freedom, where else we would go forward to? Freedom is very basic need. At least I believe so. And I really love what the solar and the Teslas of the world are doing. Because that's how you move forward. But okay. it's Let's a freedom. Make them safe first. Let's make sure. them safe. And then think of all the problems. <laughs> Loha, what about you? Um, you employ women in the value chain, right? Sure. They, they are the ones who are usually the mushroom farmers. Yeah. Uh, does it go beyond that? Does it go beyond you know, just uh, providing livelihood. Maybe you can elaborate on well, that. Well, so, so you know, it, w it wasn't designed as a, as a women-centric uh, business per se, but what we found, and we didn't particularly uh, try mm -hmm. to encourage women more than men to get into the business, but what we, we, we found is that a, a great majority, two, two times as many women are, are men are, are mushroom growers, so two-thirds of our uh, growers are, are employees too. Um, happen happen to be women, and, and so we looked into it a little bit, and yeah, it's it seems to be better suited uh, for them. It's it's the, the, what I said at the beginning: the, the tender love and care, the attention to detail. It does matter. Mushrooms have a really high yields. They grow over. They grow really fast. You know, you're in the mushroom house, but things can 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 go wrong really fast too. So you could get an infection, a parasitic fungus or a bacterial infection or something. What's really important in those cases is to detect it quickly and weed out. You know. The bad ones. Um, if, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you catch the problem early, you're, you're going to be all right. If you let it, let it go a little bit, you're going to have trouble. You might lose your entire production. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, and that's where probably women t tend to uh, beat, beat men out a little bit. Um, there's another interesting dimension, but I, I, I can't really make a claim or, or I don't have hard data about it, but we, we have uh, a, a couple of customers, uh, ladies, who, who come and buy mushroom powder. We also dry mushrooms and, and uh, and sometimes mill them into powder. And so we had this customer who re repetitively came to us to buy 
uh, you know, half a kilo, a kilo of powder, which is quite a bit, and it's a bit expensive. So we asked her why, and, and she, was, uh, she used it for her kids, for, the, for her kids, uh, and she put it in a porridge and things like that. And then she was adamant that it, she had a, a baby and she, she was uh, uh, breastfeeding, and she was adamant that it improved her, uh, her, her milk production. And so the mushrooms might be a galactagogue. I looked up the, <laughs> I looked up the term. It's, it's a galactagogue. I, never, I, I googled it. I, I never found any reference uh, to mushrooms being galactagogues. Um, but maybe because nobody ever looked into it. This, uh, so we're, we're going to look into that. That would be an interesting uh, dimension, yeah, really. Because be with too. the number of children they have in, in, in Rwanda, that would be a very useful product. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So going back to you, Lohan, do mm -hmm. you see uh, the scope for taking your business model to other, other countries or other geographies? Is, is there yeah. a conscious attempt to do that? Yeah, yeah, totally. Well, at the moment, we're talking about exporting mushrooms across the region, but it, you know, if if this takes off, yes, mm -hmm. it should be it should be regional. There's no particularly good reason why mushrooms would you know travel from Rwanda to Nairobi to Kampala. Mm -hmm. You know, once it gets going, there's other locales around the region mm -hmm. where you know either competitors will set up shop mm -hmm. or we'll do it ourselves, depending. But yeah, there's at the same time, I think there there's a logic to concentration. There's a there's a really interesting stat. So, you know, you've all seen button mushrooms and they're produced here in Watsonville, California. But the, the, the biggest state, the biggest mushroom producing state in the, in the country here in the US is Pennsylvania. And there's an interesting stat is like 47%. So half of all the mushrooms grown in the United States come out of just one county in, uh, in, uh, in Pennsylvania. And so there's, and I've seen that in other places too, where there tends to be a, a concentration. I think it goes back to a fact that really excites me actually, is that the reason there's a mushroom industry there is because some guy decided to start it. Some entrepreneur someday decided to do it there. It could have been somewhere else and then that other community would have become rich. But no, it, it was there. In the case of Pennsylvania, there was, I think it was Amish countries, so there was a lot of horse manure around and some Italian fa immigrant families, you know, they, they, they remembered doing mushrooms back home and they put two and two together and boom, now it's a $365 million a year business oh. in that county alone. And I've seen the same thing in Spain and in Holland, you have a lot of concentration. So what I'm hoping is, I was, when I started this, I was looking for something where Rwanda might have a competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. And now I'm envisioning like the, the north of Rwanda becoming like the center of excellence of mushroom growing mm -hmm. for the region, mm -hmm. but with you know, a hub and spoke system where there would be growers everywhere. That would be yeah. logical. Yeah. Right. Fantastic vision. Um, Manik, for you, um, do you see once you get to market, um, and I know the product is not necessarily for India, where do you see sort of your footprint um, in, in the world? How global is this going to be, your product? So we have already gone global, to be honest. We already have a distributor from Europe who is, have a good letter of intent of, uh, you know, a sizable order, mm -hmm. to be honest. And if we have to look for global in the security domain itself, everything that's internet of things and variables that are coming up is going to be linked to the internet. Okay. And the security of that is also going to be a huge challenge. So you have to have privacy, security, and all those things in place, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's where our long-term vision lies. We have to secure you guys from everything out there. And that can only be done if you have uh, everything out in open. And you, if everyone knows there's a problem, that, that is the whole point. Everyone gets to know that there's a problem, the problem's going to get solved. No one knows about the problem, the problem always remains. Right. Rustam, for you, um I know India is a challenging country itself in terms of building a company like yours. There's tons of competition. Where is the uniqueness and where do you see, you know, the next phase of growth happening or scale happening for you? Um, that's a good question. I mean, there's, 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 uh, it's a perception there's a lot of competition. But the first generation was just products. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of products, of course. There's a lot of solar lamps made in China. There's actually a whole city which makes it and exports it all over. But uh, our differentiating approach is we don't go as a product company, we go as an ecosystem company. So we'll go to the village, we'll understand, we'll have people who are trained to understand the demand, people who are trained to assess the technical requirement of the mm -hmm. village, and then set up the right technology for them. Okay. Of course, based on solar power. Uh, so this could be a microgrid, if it's a congested community who can't individually afford a solar panel. It could be individual systems which are financed by a bank. Uh, it could also be you know, a water pump, which has you know, water which is on a pay-as-you-go meter. So individually, so that, that fairly differentiates us. Um, and on your topic of how do we grow and how do you replicate, yeah. I think 
the concept of every social entrepreneur is you're more passionate about the problem you're solving and the idea you have uh, rather than you know, the number of branches you will set up. And I don't know if I'm speaking alone or, or the number of you know, thousands sure. of people who work for you. So that's ex what's exciting for us is people copying the model yeah. or wanting to replicate it and take it to do, do it wherever they are. And that's great for us. I mean, right. we are in it because we philosophically believe that energy is the fundamental, one of the most fundamental problems that people are suffering from. And it's a huge paradigm generational problem. Like my dad uh, studied under a streetlight mm. and he was one of the biggest bureaucrats of the country mm. because he slogged his life through studying outside streetlights, studying in neighbor's houses because he didn't have electricity. And thanks to him, I'm here. Uh, similarly, there's a generation of people who are in m you know, millions of households trying to just come up to a certain level and who need that first spark of light, who need you know, the basic uh, energy services provided. So I, I think it's, the goal for us is take it, take the model. If it works for you, go implement it in whichever country you are. We, I'm more than happy. And that's, that would be the real successful stuff for us. Great. Um, I think we're going to, we have about 17 minutes remaining. We're going to stop here and see if, uh, if there are questions from the audience. Um, I don't know if there's anybody with the mic. Okay, hi. <laughs> we have energy issues here too, you know. Yes. Um, oh. Okay, great. Hi, this question is for Monik. Um, how do you make sure that you're addressing the root of the problem, so that is the perpetrators themselves, to get that to lessen rather than putting the onus on the people that are victim of the perpetration? So what we're trying to do is build a community out there. You know, it's a more of a community effect and it's a more of a morals thing to, you know, you just can't go and put the perpetrators in jail, keep on filling, piling them up in jails and hospitals. First, you have to root it out from the community. So you get everyone involved in it. You get everyone to be their protector for that person. You get everyone out there. If I'm sitting here, if something's happening out there, I go out and help that person. That's the first part. As soon as we do that, then we start working towards the society. I hope I answer your question. So I, I'll interject there. One of the things that he's also trying to do, that the company is also trying to do, is, is create a reporting mechanism with, with police. And they're piloting that with, with the police in a particular city and seeing how they can actually have direct um, you know, signals sort of go out to a police station. And that could help with the rapid response time. Um, but I think it's still very early. Yeah, it's guess. still being done back in New Delhi. But that's the plan of action. Your friends and family know. Your police knows. And there's people around you know. So that's the whole thing. If everyone knows, that will be solved. And if everyone knows, that problem won't arise again. Mm -hmm. Any other questions out there? OK. Great. So uh, one last round of questions for all of you. Where do you see you know, your company in about 10 years from now? And Rustam, if you don't want to go yeah, first, no, no, maybe. I'll, 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 that's, that's fine. <laughs> uh, so the name of the company is Boond. And yes. Boond in Hindi or Sanskrit means a drop of water. And conceptually, that is what we want to be. We want to be the drop of water which goes and spreads across. And there's multiple droplets all over. Uh, we want to mainstream the fact that energy access is important. Uh, we want to make a strong statement. And we want in 10 years' time, that gets into the political establishments as well as the funding scene, that giving people access to energy is a fundamental solution that has to be worked on even before you industrialize your country and want it to become a superpower. Uh, even, I mean, there are more, I mean, it's, this is appalling statistics, but there are more gun manufacturers who, than there are more people who make solar electronics. And that is a shame. So uh, hopefully in 10 years we can move and change that. Uh, and so we are just a drop of water, just to signify that this can, the first drop of water to you know, quench its thirst. And in 10 years, hopefully we won't be required. I mean, it, we shouldn't be required. I mean, we should be moving on to other bigger problems. We should be working on something that's you know, in the Abraham Maslow's pyramid of needs, uh, slightly above that. If we are still sitting and electrifying villages with small solar systems after 10 years in India, God help us. 
the Indian population <laughs> is, you know, 67% under 30 years old. These people need solutions today, right now, right at this moment. If they don't, they'll find some other solution, which probably will not be good for the whole world. So in, in 10 years' time, we, we want to be a company which obviously, you know, is established in solar and doing whatever we are in a much larger scale. But we want the philosophy to penetrate the decision makers, the policies, and the investors. We want them to really understand that, you know, this is not just something you do to cleanse your guilt and, you know, feel happy about and report it in a nice document somewhere. It's something that's fundamentally essential for even your next generation. Yeah. Manik, so 10 for years. 10 years from now, no one will have to talk about security and safety in the way which I am talking about. 10 years from now, he'll be my age, first of all. That's <laughs> awesome that he's 22 right now. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> so from ten, as Rustam just mentioned, you know, 10 years from now, we shouldn't be solving these problems. 10 years from now, we should be solving the next level of problems. Right. There are a huge lot of problems arising. There's huge in medical space, healthcare, everything else. But let's solve, let's just kill this problem in the next three years and make the world safe and then move forward. Mm -hmm. That's what we would be. We would be an innovation company. As That's the reason why we kept the name Leaf Innovation. So that we can be as simple as possible and as innovative as possible. So we take the big problems, which are huge, solve them and move forward. Okay. Great. Uh -huh. Wow. Um, I don't think we're going to, uh, <laughs> I didn't set out to, to, to solve malnutrition. I'm just, I'm just hoping to make a small dent. So in, in 10, 20 years, what I'd like to see is, um, you know, I'm retired, I'm fishing somewhere, <laughs> 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 watching TV, and maybe there's a documentary about the mushroom industry in East Africa, and you see, like, you know, tens of thousands of people uh, making, a, making a decent income from mushrooms. And it's not completely a pipe dream. Uh, in China right now, there's a million small farmers that, that make money from, uh, so outgrowers, make money from growing mushrooms. Um, it's a big number and it's actually a relatively recent number. If you look at the stats that's come up in the, in the last 20 years, um, there's actually, uh, you know, there's a lot of food safety concerns with uh, China right now. So a lot of the mushrooms produced in China are for export, but there's, there's, there's consumers around the world now who are like, you know, a little, a little skittish about, you know, food safety in China, and they say that they're willing to pay a premium to get non-China products. Um, and so I think for Africa, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a market share to, to grab there. So I'm, I'm hoping that that happens. Mm -hmm. um, that would already make me very happy. But another thing that I haven't talked about uh, yet today, because I didn't want to confuse people, but there's a lot more to, to mushrooms than the, than the edible mushrooms that we, we know. In fact, fungi, there's, there's an immense diversity of fungi. They're everywhere in the world. In fact, Every breath you're all taking right now, you're, you're swallowing, you know, probably a few hundred spores of, of various fungi who hopefully won't come to anything <laughs> in, in your bodies. But, but, but fun, fungi, the spores, they're, 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 they're all around us. And some of them have really interesting characteristics that have absolutely nothing to do with, uh, with, with eating. Uh, I'm thinking of one in particular thing called uh, trichoderma, which tend to uh, associate with uh, plant roots and essentially acts as a, as a natural you know, fertilizer. It's not a fertilizer per se, but it helps the plants fight off other fungal diseases or bacterial diseases. It, it helps the plants that have been colonized by trichoderma have a much healthier, much deeper uh, root system. The basic technology to make trichoderma is so easy because right now trichoderma is a pest for me. Trichoderma is a very aggressive fungus and it's attacking oyster mushrooms. So I, I'm trying to get rid of it. I once met a guy at a conference who said, hey, I'm in mushrooms too. I said, what do you do? He goes, trichoderma. I'm like, you're crazy. Because trichoderma, I'm trying to get rid of him. Then he explained it to me that in fact, it's like used in, in, in um, organic uh, agriculture uh, to, you know, if you don't want to use chemical fertilizers and so on. And remember I told you, earlier that there's you know, a few million people in Rwanda that have to make a living from their one acre or two acres of land. I mean, imagine that you and your family having to make your entire living from that one acre of land your whole entire life. I mean, it's, when I realized that, I was like, I had this, this second aha moment and I, I still think the edible mushrooms that we've been talking about, and that's the business right now, are really important. But we can go a little a step further and start working with other fungi, which are, you know, you know, it's more subtle, but there we can really impact millions of farmers. Mm -hmm. uh, because in, in Rwanda, to put it very simply, and I'm thinking that's probably true of other African countries, there's just not enough money to go around to buy the yeah. fertilizers that, that, are, that are needed um, and, you know, the, any, anything that farmers need. So those are 
fertilizers, let's call them that to simplify, that could be produced in country. You don't need foreign exchange to buy them anymore, mm. and that would be cheaper and could be distributed to through, through the agro uh, systems, agro dealer systems uh, throughout the country and impact the lives, improve mm -hmm. the productivity of the one asset they do happen to have is that little patch of land. So that's, that's where I'm, I'd great. like to go. Yeah, mm. no, great. Inspiring stories, and I think you all have a lot to, lot to achieve, a lot to do. I think great vision out there. Um, privileged to share the stage with all of you, and I think we'll, we'll bring it to a close in case there are any other questions. Please catch these guys off stage. Um, and thank you again. Thank you, Rustam, Manek, Lohan. Thank you. Thank you so much.